Today on This American Dice, we present to you Dungeon World, Cousins Edition, Mission to Mount Gloom, Episode 4, the penultimate episode. After having gone through the caverns within Mount Gloom and encountered Jorge, the god of death, our heroes now find themselves in an idyllic village filled with four-inch gnomes. But where is this great weapon that they can use to save the kingdom of King K. Casserole from the evil dinosaur legions that, as we speak, are besetting the city? And what dark dealings has Dr. Pilkus dealt? We'll deal those dealings and deal with more during this diabolical doing. D-Sounds! Today on This American Dice. Like, we see, like, a big aerial shot of this city where clearly there's a battle going on below. And um, we see all of these human archers, like, on the walls of this city, like, firing arrows. And the thing they're firing at, there seems to be a big shadow that kind of looms over them. And they're like, whoa! And they kind of, like, try to run out of the way. A few keep shooting arrows, and they're like, it's not doing anything! And we see that there's a... um, like a massive like Brachiodon or Brontosaurus, whatever dinosaur is the biggest long neck dinosaur. And um, it has like this like almost veil of like kind of chain mail armor like around its face. And um, like as it gets close to the thing, it just kind of like lays its big head down and it has a helmet on and it lays its head down and along its neck run all these like raptor and other dinosaur people. And so they can leap on. And so they're using the Brachiodons as this like... Uh, siege engine type thing and above are pterodactyls that are dropping either stones or like um that are carrying a few um that are carrying almost like baskets of some of these other kind of raptor-esque warriors and dropping them on the walls of this city and um there's a there's a person who like runs up to the king king k casserole and it's like like sir they're their, their siege dinosaurs have begun have, have begun sending bringing troops into the into the city our walls have already been breached and he's like my god it truly is over for us and we zoom over to the uh, the dinosaur um, the encampment where the king of the dinosaurs was there we see that there is in like the this great tent this kind of mobile fortress of King Tyrannus Maximilian V, uh, just the egg. Uh, we see that there's the Vizier Raptor, his Jafar-like kind of character who has a staff with a, um, like a, it's like dinosaur claw clutching a ruby. And he says like, yes, yes, you should go. Go indeed, just in case, in case anything unexpected were to occur. And you see, um, like a group of dinosaurs, a triceratops, and um, several ra- um, a triceratops, two raptors, and one of those dinosaurs, a Dilophosaurus, the ones with like the crazy neck thing, um, like kind of like bow. And the triceratops, who's wearing a fez, is like, "Of course, of course, yes, my lord." And they kind of like head off and get on one of these weird baskets, uh, and a pterodactyl picks them up, and they fly off over the city. We see a a shot of Mount Gloom, this like foreboding mountain off in the distance. And um, there's it like the peak of which goes up above the clouds, which are perpetually in these kind of dark uh, lightning strike storms. And um, then we see from your perspective, you guys kind of like passing through that sphere that you walked through after you had spoken with Hor, God of Death. And um, when your eyes kind of like that kind of thing of when you're in a dark room and you walk into the light and your eyes take a while to adjust and you guys are able to see this like idyllic country town 
and it goes on for kind of a while, and you're in this insane position where um, there seems to be an entire, like, large town, probably of thousands of people. Like, I'm going to go ahead and say it's maybe even a small city in the surrounding countryside. And there's probably, let's say, 10,000 people living in this. Um, and there are little farms, there are some buildings, and all of this exists within this maybe, like, um, 500 yard long by maybe... 150 yard wide um, tube and you're in this kind of weird almost like a cave but you look at the top and like the top of the cave is very very smooth not like a cave that would be made just naturally and if you look behind you it is almost this like uh, shining reflective red orb that you're looking at like the con uh, convex side of it and the light comes in and it kind of shines off this orb and everything in here seems gorgeous seems beautiful seems like this idyllic countryside the kind of countryside you'd see on some great British baking show kind of stuff and um, you look around and you see these people that are kind of like coming up to you very clearly being like my god we've never seen this before except they all sounds like oh my god we've never seen this oh geez for all these people are small, four foot, I'm not four foot, four inch tall, little humanoids. Very much think David the Gnome kind of style. And uh, yeah, so like a, a crowd of them kind of gather around you and you guys are there at like uh, near, essentially at like the outskirts near a farm and there are farms where people seem to be farming mushrooms that are to you guys normal sized mushrooms, but to them are probably like, my God, I've grown the biggest pumpkin in town kind of thing. And uh, they're all staring up at you. There's maybe a gaggle of 15, 20 of them. And they're like, oh, where did you come from? Where did you come from? Where did you come from? Hi, you're so big. How did you get so large? Where could you have come from? Is there anything valuable uh, that I notice in this miniature town? <laughs> Sure. So, um, that sounds as you're just, you're just looking around. Uh, this is almost <laughs> so alien as these people are like, hello, anyone? Oh, maybe they don't. And the, another one turns and says like, oh, we shouldn't assume that they could speak our language. Of course they can't. Why they're foreign. Who knows what language they speak? And another one says like, you shouldn't assume that. For some reason, we speak the same language of a lot of things. Um... Yeah, that sounds like a discern realities role if you're like surveying this land of well, here could be pretty good. Yeah. So go ahead and roll plus wisdom. Matt immediately looks for treasure. <laughs> All right. We're gonna do this. Is there anything I can take? Yeah, that's that's hurtful immediately. Seven. You got a seven? Okay, so on a seven you get to ask one of those questions. What here is useful or valuable to me? There we go. Okay, what here is useful or valuable to you? You kind of look around and you don't see a lot in regard to... You don't see much, anything that looks like it's gold. You don't see bright, shiny rubies or diamonds anywhere. Um, you don't see any silver in particular. And at first you're like, man, there's not much of anything. These people are... And you then you realize... Uh, Why would you... Yeah. More better question. <laughs> well, <laughs> my character. so what could be useful to you is that uh, there does seem to be these four inch tall little, these four inch tall little people. There do seem to be thousands of them here. So that could be something useful to you if you were to leverage that in the right way, that there's like a huge number. There's like a city worth of these small little people. They're gnomes. They're little gnomes. So yeah, so think David the Gnome style. In fact, they're wearing like the pointy little hats and everything. And uh, again, I think uh, I think there's kind of like a, a bustle and a commotion as uh, more of them are like, like looking and they're like, do you think they're here to eat us? Like as they're talking to each other and another one says like, like you shouldn't assume that about somebody. I eat one. 
right there. No, I'm just kidding. Wait, 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 wait Matt. Hold on. Wait on that. I have my uh, ability. Remember that I picked my moth to flame that helps me weaken the minds. I think it helps you take advantage of a weak mind. I don't know if it helps you weaken minds. They seem like pretty weak minds. <laughs> they seem pretty dumb. I'll take. I don't think they're weak minds, man. They got huge, uh, tiny city, giant they're mushrooms. They're culturally competent. <laughs> so you think? Like a moth to the flame. You when you tempt, when you have a weak mind with your oh. inner fire. <laughs> what the hell even is that? You know what? You can you can go with it. Go with it, Slim. Let's see if you can scare the hell out of these people. You guys are you guys are giants that just emerged. So I'm, I'm joining him. him. Right? I'm joining him. I'm really well, let's let's see how he does with this role. All right, because my oh. my my theory with this is this is the equivalent of like if King Kong or Godzilla suddenly appeared, um, pretty much anybody would be terrified. So, so in I there, got, uh, a whopping two ones plus a two. Nice. Okay, so even if even if somebody was to help, they could not help you out here. Mm. Um. All right, you guys. <laughs> so can I use flexible morals to convince them that? We are here with good intentions and need their help. Um, I think Joey fucked that up pretty bad for you just now. <laughs> I think Joey like looks down at them. I'm sorry, Slim. I think Slim the Salamander looks down at them, and uh, his eyes flame up, and they're like, they're like, my God, demons! The old, the old legends are true. And uh, these creatures are like like running away, and some of them run back into their little houses. <laughs> Others are like running towards the city, and like you hear off in the distance, um, you hear like a really comically goofy, like like alarm, like that to them sounds like this very courageous call to arms, but to you guys, you're like, is someone blowing a kazoo? I like that you had the kazoo ready oh, for this it, moment. Amazing. It's a toy harmonica <laughs> that someone gave me a long time ago, and it does say, Jesus puts a song in my heart. Yeah, you, you kind of hear this, and um, as that's going on, you also see um, this, like, like a shape kind of come in from the distance. As you guys are looking out, you are kind of seeing this big, like, uh, circular opening that seems to be where like most of the light is coming through. And um, the area where you are seems to have bigger farms, especially like mushroom farms and that kind of stuff. Like most of the like buildings that you see seem to be closer to where that light is and where the circular like opening is basically. And uh, almost imagine like you're in a big cave. But again, like I said, the top is smooth. Um, so it seems like it was man-made or made by something rather than naturally forming. And um, you see something come into that, and it seems to be a huge flying creature that's coming in and uh, kind of like alighting or landing where uh, more of those buildings are. Back inside the orb back inside the sphere where Dr. Pilkus Goldstein still remains with the very horny Tim Curry smoke monster death god. And uh, so, again, Jorge, god of death, is uh, circling around you and kind of some of the wisps of uh, its smoke are kind of like entangled around you. And he and it says just like, oh, oh of course, Pilkus, you, you know that there has, there to, be has to be a sacrifice. And if you're, and if, and you're, if you and your if friends, you are, friends to proceed, are to proceed, it seems, it seems as, though as though there has to be has something, to be given, something up. given up. At the moment, At the that, moment something that something is you. Is you. So it seems so it as seems though as you're, you're to be, you're the, to be one the one left, left here, here with, with me. me. You're so, you're so mine. mine. Oh, how sweet. How sweet. Unless, Unless you could, you could make, it make it more interesting, interesting for, me. for me. Take it, man. My soul's yours. So, and he's like, oh. <laughs> to become one. Just kidding. Take it, Kelly. 
I give you Joey's call. <laughs> he says, Slim, the salamander, you can kill him. Ooh, a salamander. A salamander. A salamander. Because it's Tim Curry and he talks weird. A salamander. A salamander. Hmm. hmm. It's been so it's long been so since long I've long tasted one of their delightful lives. lives. I, I think, I don't know. Let's say that's true in this world. Fuck it. If you can deliver, you can his, deliver soul his soul to me, soul perhaps, to me. perhaps I can keep... I can keep perhaps, perhaps that's, that's what I can what put, I can in, put place in place while I... <laughs> wait <laughs> for you. Meaning till you die from whatever else kills you. I'll deliver him, all right. And he goes, all right. Either way, Either way you'll be you'll seeing be me seeing eventually. eventually. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. yes. And he wiggles off. And, oh, I think, um, and he goes, now come and come give, and me, a give hug. me a hug. And he comes and he hugs you. And it's like this dark smokes in your face and you're kind of coughing. And um, as you guys uh, on the outside of this sphere see this like flying creature kind of land and it's landing maybe like 300 to 300 50 yards, 300 to 400 yards probably away from you guys. So it's landing a good long distance. Um, it, uh, you hear like coughing behind you. And you, when you look back, there's Dr. Pilkis Goldstein. Dude, that guy has coronavirus? Yeah, he, um, yeah, actually it was just, it was just a really wet fart. And it just got stuck in your throat. It was one of those ones where you really, you really breathed it in. You huffed the stuff at the wrong moment. There, that's what happened. It was one of those very hot farts when you're in the car and the heater's on, and it gets just stuck, and you can't. You're like, oh, it was that. So, all right, we've got all five of our player characters back in the same uh, situation. You're in this long tunnel that's about 500 yards. Uh, you, I'm you with them are, now. Yes, you guys are at the very back of it. You just pop it, in. Yeah, the opening is 500 yards away from you guys. It's circular. The diameter of the thing is about um, 150 to 200 yards wide. So it's kind of like again, it's this like tube. So imagine living in a giant pipe. And uh, there seem to be these gnomes, but they've all run away. So Dr. Pocus, I don't think you've seen any of these gnomes. But uh, everybody else has seen these David the Gnome esque little people. Uh, I'm with the group now. Yes, you are. I take my hammer and swing it as hard as I can into Joe's body. I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight back. Salamanders are always on guard. First thing first, Slim. I assume you don't want him to do this, right? That would be correct. Yes. Uh, All right. I, I would rather. I would rather maybe even counter his attack because I am so. a salamander. In fact, I am quite fast. <laughs> okay. So here's how this is going to work. If he gets salamanders are probably not that fast. What was the last salamander you seen? You very about? small legs, and they can't be out of a moist a, area for very I long. I am a. I'm a humanoid salamander. Hence, I am always moist. So slim. You're probably trying to stop. Dr. Good. Goldstein from from a- attacking you. So, in depending on what he got in a little bit, you'll be able to um, try to interfere with that and see if you can bring his roll down a step. So, meaning if he got a seven, knock it down to a six. If he got a ten, knock I, it down to a nine. I can't. I can't counter his attack. You'll be able to attack in a little bit later. And if he's attacking you and you're able to defend yourself then the same stuff would work based on how a hack and slash roll normally works. All right, all right so what do I got to do? Can I so, say, Austin? Sorry, you're a psychopath right now. This is what would really happen in real life, right? Jake comes out of this smoke cloud swinging his hammer at us. I say, he's on drugs, everybody. We got to kill <laughs> crazed maniac right now. Oh, but so hold, hold on, on hold on. I would definitely get an advantage here, would I not? They're not expecting just, me just to on, Just on me, but not the group. Yeah, yeah, whatever happens. Once you attack me, you put yourself in a terrible situation. See, so I'm yeah. friends with That's the rest of the group. So this is, this is one of the reasons that this game doesn't work out as well for this stuff. But here's the deal. If somebody would want to defend, as in try to protect Slim, they could roll that. I vote for Barbard helping me. He's my bond. But I guess. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, I have a advanced move for this. Hurts, go ahead and roll uh, <laughs> and roll, which is plus constitution. Oh wow! I rolled really, really good. Eight. Eight. All right. I was hoping I could kind of get him awkwardly coming out of Just this cloud of smoke all hopefully in a haze and kind of like bump him before he smashes Joey with his hammer and maybe just grazes him or something and try and like intervene in sure. this chaos. You can try because I can't get caught off guard. So that's kind of what I'm going for. So you could, you can have the uh, attacks of fa- uh, damage on Joey, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm rolling so in, too. My, in my mind, I'm envisioning me like, not being able to get caught off guard, seeing Jake's character come out of this cloud, swinging his hammer, and trying to, like, just smack, like, bump into him so he doesn't destroy Joey's character. Okay, so so we've got that. So this attack is going to be halved. It's damage, but don't roll your damage just yet because Joey, you said Slim, is also going to try to hinder um, what... Uh, Dr. Pilkus Goldstein is doing here. Or interfere, that's the term they use. Okay, yes. Alright, so go ahead and roll your bond with Dr. Pilkus if you have any bond with him. No, I have a bond with Bard Bard. Alright, so then you just literally roll 2d6 and it's just the raw result. I got a 6. Okay, so unfortunately that doesn't do anything. <laughs> Alright. I'm, I'm so gonna roll it. I got one more to level up. But. All right, so yeah, you do get an experience point. Thank you for reminding. Oh me. wait, I leveled up though. Hey, that's pretty good. So uh, while you're while you're taking some damage, you can think about uh, what you're getting. All right, so Jake, you're gonna roll your damage, but as a heads up on scent of blood, that's for that's when you hack and slash an enemy. Your next attack, so your next attack against him could get an additional plus D four. This one won't get that. Got ya. Oof. Eight. <laughs> three plus one. Eight and three plus one. All, All right. right. 12. Uh, 12. All right. So six damage is coming your way, Slim. So he comes out. He's hacking uh, from this smoke. And uh, as you guys turn around, you're like, Dr. Pilk said he just screaming runs at Slim and hits him hits in this glancing blow with a hammer that uh, had Herzl not kind of gotten involved and been like, what are you doing? Watch out, this guy's insane! Um, would have absolutely knocked his uh, knocked his head off. Meanwhile, I think um, maybe Brandon, you are most uh, kind of like aware of the rest of your surroundings, especially as a ranger. You're used to looking off on the distance and being like, ah, oh, yes, over there. That's where the trouble is in the woods. And uh, you kind of look out and see, like, hmm, there seems to be trouble afoot as uh, there seem to be other creatures much larger than these gnomes in the um, in the area where, like, most of these buildings are. Okay, so there are other creatures there? <laughs> There's other shapes that appear to be larger because, like, um, you, you as a hunter are, have very good eyes, especially with Frederico, but the deal is that looking out uh, like 350, 400 yards off into the distance, you can't see any of those gnomes. At that point, that would be like that would be like seeing a mouse across four football fields. It's like it's probably not possible, even for you. But you see, there are creatures that are larger than that, kind of in that distance, and you're like, okay, something's going on over there. Can I have Frederico go scout, see what's up? Sure, that sounds good. Maybe you even have as part of your uh, adventuring gear, maybe like a looking glass kind of a thing, like a pirate ship-esque <laughs> telescope kind of deal. Sure, I'll use an adventuring gear. Sure. So, um, Frederico has... Frederico gives you a bonus, I think, when you are doing certain things. I gotta find it. Um, when you work with your animal companion on its training, on something it's trained in, you add your cunning, you add its cunning to your role. So what is Frederico's cunning? Plus two. 
plus two. So that plus the adventuring gear. Uh, yeah, you're adding plus three to whatever you get. So it'll be tough to fuck this up entirely. What am I adding? Am I doing like dexterity or intelligence or what? Oh, that's right. So it's it's gonna max out. I think it. Uh, so it'll be two d six plus your wisdom modifier. Plus... I got twelve anyway. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so even if you got zero, even if you had minus two, you'd still be fine. All right, so you get to ask, I think, three of those discern reality questions as you look off into the distance with the spyglass and have Frederico flying about. What is about to happen? What is about to happen? Um, you look off in the distance and you see, bum, 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 dinosaurs. There is a pterodactyl that has brought a group of four dinosaurs, um, four of the Wicked Dinosaur Legion here, and uh, they seem to be like in the square talking, and one of the ones that you see is a famed character named Ambassador Rex, and he's a a humanoid triceratops wearing a fez, and uh, he seems to be speaking to all of these gnomes, and uh, the gnomes are all kind of listening. And you're wagering, especially if you guys don't do something to stop this and quick, you may well have to be fighting these various dinosaurs and also a city of 10,000 gnomes. Okay, so my next question is what here is useful or valuable to me? So we can figure something out. What here is useful or valuable to you? Um, I'll answer this question in kind of the bigger um, phrase. You kind of look around and you're like, man, this cave is like almost perfectly cylindric. And the way it's shaped and you think back and you're not a person who uses magic, but you maybe have seen wizards and other people kind of like channel magic through certain items and especially things like crystals and runes and uh, you're like, wait a minute. There was a tube that we went up through. It probably wasn't the only tube. There were these crystals. Wait a minute. Those things seem to power something. This is this long cylindrical, oh my God, you realize you are in an enormous cannon. So all of this, this entire gnomish society exists within this massive cannon. So that's pretty useful, especially given that you guys were tasked with finding something to stop the Dinosaur Legion. And you take a plus one forward when you act on these answers. Who's in control here? Um, Unfortunately, it seems like if you don't do something very quickly, uh, the person in control here will be Ambassador Rex of the Dinosaur Legion. We're gonna die. We're gonna get blown up in this cannon. So can I just make a friggin' run for it and grab everybody? <laughs> well, they're fighting. I don't know what to do. So, well, here's the unfortunate thing. Um, you are literally at, like, the base of this cylinder because you came through magically with the help of a god. You came through that weird, like, sphere. So you don't know if you can get back onto the other side of the thing. Like doing that, you're literally not sure of how to do that. The easy way to escape, by comparison, is to make the 500 yard um, sprint out of this cannon that theoretically you're still on a mountain that's above the clouds. So then you'd have to be like, this that could also end poorly. So you're like, uh-oh. But yeah, meanwhile, Dr. Pilkis Goldstein just just smote a glancing blow to Slim that probably spun him around pretty good. Um, other folks, what are you up? Oh, but Slim, no, you didn't reduce his, uh, his attack. So other folks, what are you up to? Trying to get everyone to stop fighting. <laughs> okay, so maybe, uh, maybe, what does Brandon say to try to get folks to, to knock it off? Uh, tell them about the situation that's happening, that we're stuck in a cannon. So yeah, Brandon yells that, like, like this thing is the weapon. This thing is the Hold weapon. On, wait. What are you looking for? They don't know about my deal with the God of Death. That's correct. 
so they don't know why I came out swinging. That's um, true. Can I go? Can I deceive oh, them? You, can you deceive them? Sure. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. say that uh, I was fighting the god of death. And that's why I came out swinging. I didn't mean to hit him. Okay. Um, I'm going to use uh, my ability charming and open. <laughs> I'm doing something. Are, well, oh, you're well, done? Are you still well, going? Well, what, I is, you're what, is, what is charming and open? Uh, I could speak frankly with someone and they have to answer honestly from a list of questions. Charming and open. <laughs> and they don't know what my... They, they don't have any clue as to what my motivations are. Because they don't know what my deal was with the god of death. So even if he asks me a question, it can't be based on why I came out attacking Joey because he would have no idea. Dr. Pocus Goldstein, you come out and you say, like, I was fighting the god of death. Uh, oh, oh, what what happened? Um, I think, Slim, this would be a good opportunity for you to make a role of um, defying danger. And the danger in this case is believing this lie. All right. Well, I got to roll 2D, uh, 2D4. 2D6. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Or, you got a 10? Okay. So you got a 10. Plus what, like wisdom or something? It's plus... I got a 12 if it's plus wisdom, but... What here is... He's uh, uh, using mm-hmm. charm, no. Social grace, mental fort... It might be mental fortitude, so it might be plus wisdom. It might be intelligence. So whatever, I got 11 or 12. 11 or 12. Okay, so you're pretty good. Um. So, I think you know something's up. Something's not true with that story. Correct. Yeah. I don't know what to so, with that story. Um, yes, yeah, so you know something's up with that story. It's not quite. It's not quite uh, working out. Bard, Bard, did you want to try your charming and open? Because that's what I am. I'm charming and I'm naked. <laughs> Speak frankly with someone. Okay, so I feel like this is usually the kind of situ- the kind of deal where like you would have to tell him something that like otherwise you wouldn't or open up to him in some kind of way that you wouldn't. He can ask and- me whatever he wants. I- <laughs> it's his choice. I can I can appreciate that, but I think that like to initiate this conversation in this way is like it would be the and I apologize, Matt, if I'm stepping on any toes here, but it would be the kind of, the kind of thing of like Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the therapist to a person who doesn't want it. It's kind of a thing of like like oh this person's not interested necessarily in opening up, and you could be as honest and willing to open up with them, and they're like fuck you, I'm I'm not doing it. Yeah, isn't that the whole point of this though? Because he he doesn't he came out and we're like we're all skeptical of why he came out the way he did. So this lets me ask him something, but then you know he gets the chance to ask me something, which doesn't really benefit him too much. No. Yeah, I mean you've got you got a point there. All right, so let's let's flip it to start it this way. So, um, Doctor Pocus Goldstein, if you could ask Bard Bard a question, what would that question be? Nothing. Nothing. My question is: even if they don't believe me, they don't know why. So what question could he possibly I have a ask list. me? There's this, I have a list of questions right. that I can ask. Probably. I mean, he, so might, he might be asking you, like, why are you doing what you're doing? Yeah. And in that case, it might actually, it might get us to some point, at least where maybe you, you guys can't, stop And the whole point of this thing is you can't lie. I'll Let's answer Bard Bard's question. You'll, you'll answer, answer Bard Bard's question? Okay, well, what is, what is your question for him? Or you could just answer his, and then we'll get to a question you have for him. I'll answer his. Go for it. Um, so one of the questions I have on my list is, whom do you serve? Whom do you serve? Myself. There you go. I answered it. I, I now work. take another swing at Joey. Well, hold on. Let's have you an- ask some kind of question of uh, Bard Bard. I think you ask, you ask one of these from this list. Whom do you serve? What do you wish I would do? How can I get you to do blank? What are you really feeling right now, or what do you most desire? Okay, I'll ask him what he is really feeling right now. What are you really feeling right now, Bard Bard? Cold, because I'm naked. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So, uh, aside from physically, how else are you feeling? 
Uh, <coughs> quite nervous. There's a man swinging a hammer. <laughs> All right, quite nervous. I'm going to mute Herzl for a second. All right, so quite nervous. There's a man swinging. So he's feeling very nervous. Um, I think this is when you guys are able to hear Brandon saying, uh, like, hey, look, there's something going on. We're inside a cannon right now. Do you have any other warnings you want to give these uh, these ding-dongs? That they got to stop goofing off or we're going to die. <laughs> so, yeah, if you guys don't stop goofing off, we're going to die. They don't know I was lying. They don't know... Well, they they don't believe they don't necessarily don't believe my story. But yeah, Slim Slim does not believe your story. Can Herzl right, well. start sprinting out of this cannon in here again? Sure, you can start sprinting out of the cannon, but it is like a five hundred yard thing. So you can you can do this, but it'll be a it'll be a schlep, especially <laughs> especially for someone who's like two feet tall. <laughs> Yeah, to you, the uh, yeah, the gnomes to you are not uh, that small. You're like, yeah, they're tiny. This is a terrifying place. All, All right. right. So, uh, meanwhile, then, yeah. So Herzl, Herzl takes off, and we'll we'll come to that. Yeah, Herzl. So you're kind of running, that uh, like towards the opening in this in this cavern that you're in. You're kind of like passing these things, but again. I follow Herzl. <laughs> and Brandon and Brandon heads that way too, uh, a couple of steps behind. And it's this idyllic countryside. It's actually like this beautiful countryscape. Um, as you guys are running towards the opening of this cavern, and uh, but Brandon, you do know that as you run this way, this is also towards where those dinosaurs are. Yeah, we have a better chance of fighting the dinosaurs than being blown up. Okay. Good point. All right. Back to Slim and Dr. Pilkus Goldstein. All right, so... Um, Dr. Pilkus, you're you're going to attack Slim again when you get the moment, right? I think I have no choice. I think I have to. Dr. Pocus is once again wheeling around after he kind of like uh, at, he, at this he, point I feel like I should have the right to counter because this is no longer by surprise. So I think if we put this where he can make the roll and Dr. Pocus Goldstein can interfere if he wants to from being attacked, that could work out I and kind of be a little more balanced. Appropriate for the situation. I feel like I'm more on guard than him. Him swinging that heavy hat. I don't think you're more on guard than him, but the two of you are equally on guard with this stuff, and you oh, haven't sure. you haven't actively rolled in doing a thing. Your rolls have all been reactionary. So go ahead and make a. If you're, what are you doing to attack him? If that's what you're doing, I'm gonna risk go for the biscuit and use burning brand. I'm gonna conjure a weapon of pure flame. It's gonna be two rolls, right? Okay, so go ahead and roll burning brand. All right, I got a. Well, I have a question. If he conjures a weapon, isn't that his roll? The conjuring of the weapon, because that takes. Yeah, yeah. I have two rolls. I have two rolls. So, so that's again, that's one. Of, again, that's one of the reasons this game doesn't work super well for this stuff because it's like, theoretically, he would make this roll, and in D and D, this might be considered like a, on his turn, free or move action or that kind of thing, and then there'd be a standard action. But in this, it's like, you do it narratively, so there's no set order for any of this stuff. It's just what would kind of make sense, and unfortunately in this situation, what would be fairest? And there's there's not a good not a good one here. I will say if we if we shelve this conflict possibly for a little bit, there'll certainly be opportunities for you guys to uh, interfere with one another as you're dealing with the dangers of the world itself. Well, I got an eight to conjure my weapon of flame. You got an eight to conjure your weapon of flame. When you conjure a weapon of pure flame, roll plus constitution. On a seven to nine, choose one. So what are you doing? I'm going to do a, a throw or, or a near weapon. Okay. So again, it's like throw. fireball ninja stars. Uh, yeah, to the eyes at least. Okay. So you're going to do that. 
Am I within stabbing range? Well, he did just hit you with a hammer, so you're certainly within melee range. I just don't, I just, I just don't want to roll on strength, so I, I think I, I'd rather roll on either dexterity or, in, or like, constitution or something. I, I, just, I, I wouldn't rely on my own strength, so I'd rather throw something than use my physical abilities to pierce the skin. Well, you can... <laughs> Um, well, you can, in that case, if you're trying to throw something at him, when you take aim and shoot an enemy at range, you roll plus dexterity. So, I'd rather that. Uh, okay, the deal is he is fighting you with a hammer. So, I'm gonna go ahead and switch this up and tell you just the throne or near one doesn't make sense. You might want to remove the dangerous tag or add plus one damage. Given that he's he's yeah he's literally hitting you with a hammer. I uh, removed the dangerous tag then. Okay, so this is now no longer dangerous. All right, so now go ahead and make a hack and slash roll, Slim. And that, but that is strength. What, what does that add on? Strength. So it's two uh, d six plus your strength modifier. I got a seven. You got a seven. All right. So in this case, this is where this kind of works out. So each of you are going to end up doing your damage to one another. So Slim. Go ahead and roll a d8. Well, I have three. I have one d8. Thank God. <laughs> but uh, I, what am I rolling here? You roll your base damage, which is a d10. D10. Uh, one d8. I got a ten. You got a ten. So a ten plus, or I'm sorry, a ten, and then Joey, what did you get? I got a one. You got a one. All right, so you have this fire that kind of flicks off Dr. Pocus Goldstein's armor. Well, meanwhile, Dr. Pocus Goldstein, um, yep, he hits Slim with a hammer, or unless <laughs> yep. unless Bard Bard wants to possibly defend. No way! I already him. got intervened with once. I fucking crushed this bitch. I know, but it but it might end up being it's that Bard Bard has, Bard dead. Bard has to take the damage for him. Um, good. He's naked. Yeah, I'm naked. I'm naked and afraid. Oh, well, <laughs> the only one who knows we all? Ability. This is a tattoo. This is just a terrible farmer's tan that I have. I don't think it's quite necessary for you to step in, Bard Bard. But if you want to, you can let it happen. Um, how much? Uh, how many hit points does Joey have? I have three left. There you go. Oh, so he's dead. Uh, you, don't, you don't know my secret ability. I'm going to... Uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't really have many options. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just run towards Matt. <laughs> towards All right, the bar bar is like, oh fuck, I'm out of here. He says, zoinks. And he runs. All right. Yeah. So that goes on. Okay, we're going to join Herzl and Frederico again. I'm sorry, Herzl and Brandon and Frederico. Um, so you guys are running, and you're running. And at some point, you kind of come to this large number. There's maybe like 40 or 50 of these gnomes. And they're only four feet tall, but they've got like uh, pitchforks and rakes. A few of them seem to be like um, maybe the equivalent of like guard members or that kind of thing. And they have spears, but the spears are basically just pointed chopsticks like a pencil almost. Wait, they're four feet tall? Nope, four inches tall. Oh, Did I say four feet tall? No, yeah. they're four inches tall. They're four inches tall. They're like mice. And um, they're like I let Frederico mice. eat them. Yeah, honestly, Frederico probably is like, oh my God, what a buffet. <laughs> um Later on, if you guys survive this, you're going to find a bunch of gnome skulls and Frederico's pellets. It's going to be <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> yeah. So they're like, 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 stop, halt, you, halt, you curs, you intruders, halt! Frederico eats them. I have a hunt ability. <laughs> um, do you, but do you guys want to just keep running through all these gnomes or do you want to stop to talk to them or what? Oh, maybe we should stop to talk to them. Can I, can I leap over the horde of them and continue running? Uh, yeah, you could try to leap over them with dexterity. You could try to bowl through them with strength as they leap up. They're only you. three feet tall. They're not even three feet. Yeah, they're four inches tall. Leap. Matt, we must have talked to them. 
leap or find out if they're edible. <laughs> they're edible. I'm gonna let my owl eat them if they're annoying, but if I want to know first. <laughs> no. I'm uh, I'm leaping over this this crew. All right, awesome. So Herzl's just gonna jump over. Um, Are well, we let's, let's have. Let's, well, yeah, Herzl was the one. No, let's have Brandon do this because if Brandon fails, you can still leap over them. Nice. If Brandon succeeds, then you don't need to. So, uh, Brandon, you want to talk to these gnomes. So you're trying to maybe parlay with them. Okay. What is uh, or no, you're trying to, you're trying to get them not to attack you guys. And you're trying to talk your way out of this. So this is a defy danger with charisma. Okay. <laughs> so I roll 2d6? 2d6 plus your charisma bonus. Which oh. is nothing, so this is fun. <laughs> I got six. <laughs> six. So unfortunately, that's a failure unless Matt wants to somehow help you. Unless Herzl wants to help you. Or maybe he's just jumping over all these gnomes. No, Herzl is leaping over this crew of people and continuing out of the cannon. He's terrified. He's terrified oh, Jake characters psychotically murdering <laughs> our salamander friend. We're in a cannon. There's dinosaurs, midget people smaller than me. He's out. So, right. so what happens now that I failed to persuade the midget people? So, oh, um... They kill I've got, I've got, an, I've got an awesome thing. You're not gonna love it, but I, I think it's awesome. Oh God. Okay, so Herzl, oh, no, go no, ahead no. and roll Defy Danger to leap over this horde of gnomes. I thought it was one d six. It's two d six. Have you been rolling one d six? No, you haven't, because you've been getting better <laughs> results than that. So that's bullshit. <laughs> your Who brain, knows, your brain just Who shit knows? out the Who fact, knows? the information. It's just like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, one and two, whatever. How many, how many wives do you have, Matt? <laughs> I don't remember. Not enough. <laughs> did I tell you when I when I told did I tell you when I told Pop up I got engaged? He goes, "Now you're gonna get in real trouble." <laughs> amazing. Yeah. amazing. That's how you get in real trouble. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> So I listened to uh, I got a six. I listened to the, the video that I that I have of a conversation that I have with Pop Up when I told him Matt shit his pants driving home. <laughs> it's the, <laughs> the funniest thing of all time. Yeah, if anybody takes a dump, Pop Up is gonna probably laugh for about a half an hour. <laughs> He's crying on the phone. It's hysterical. He has never forgotten that story about Matt shitting his pants. It's a pretty funny story. <laughs> it's a good story. All right, I'm sorry, Matt. What did you get? Seven. Seven. All right, so you're going to jump over these gnomes, but you barely fucking make it. So you're like, no, God. And I think, like, maybe you just barely clear some of their taller spears. Like, a few of them are like, really reach up. And they're like, whoa. They maybe prick you at the ankle as you leap over them. And, um... You're able to kind of like hustle through, but um, as you kind of like look ahead, you're running and running and looking back at those gnomes and you see that Brandon is not talking their way out of this situation. And um, when you kind of look back, you realize that um, uh, two of these dinosaurs are kind of up ahead of you. And that's gonna be another obstacle for you to manage to get away from and uh, is probably going to have to involve you engaging with these dinosaurs in some way or another. So you're like, uh oh, out of the frying pan, into the fire. This is a nightmare. Yeah. All right. Meanwhile, Frederico, I'm sorry, Brandon, I keep seeing Frederico as it says B and Frederico. <laughs> Frederico, that's fine. So, Brandon, you are like, uh, what is it that you say to these gnomes that you're like, please, we can all just get along? I said, hey, dude, stop. Hey, dude, stop. And they're like, they they decide to gulliver you. And so they throw all these, like, nets at you. And they throw, um, like, uh, like grappling hooks and other stuff. <laughs> and at first you're like, what the hell? This is just a string. And then, like, 12 more strings. And you're like, god damn it. And you kind of fall down. 
and um, to get out of this, you're gonna have to like pull yourself up. And you look over, and Frederico is like, like a, a gnome cowboy is like yeehaw, and thrown a lasso and got his leg, and it's carrying the gnome around. But then several others weigh it down, and he's like, woo, woo, woo. he's also kind of like struggling. The two of you are struggling to get out of this situation. Bard, Bard, put up some awesome of artwork. All right, so we'll come back to you with that because we got to see what Bard Bard is running towards this exact situation yep. and might be able to help you out in a moment. I'm on my but, way. But meanwhile, um, we've got Slim and Dr. Pilkus Goldstein. All right, so you two have been fighting with one another. All of I your killed friends, him, didn't I? Uh, not, not quite yet, but all of your friends have run off. Are you still committed to fighting one another? I got a yes. Yeah, I'm killing him. Yeah, yeah, I'm still fighting this piece of shit. <laughs> I killed him. I hit him with, I, I did 10 damage. He's dead. So, all right, well, he said he has three left. Um, no, I did yeah, 16 so damage. I did six I before. The ability that I added in the beginning of this game. He's dead. Six before, 10 now. Little does he think I'm dead. So, how are you doing hit point wise? Uh, slam. Go, ahead. Go ahead. It doesn't matter. Let him kill me. I'm going to use Burning Bridges. Can he use that after he's already dead? That's the point of the ability, big tough guy. Slim, are you are you at zero hit points or no? I'm at, I was at three before this ordeal, so I'm 100% dead. Okay, so. Yeah, all right. and, so then in that case, Slim, go ahead and roll. Oh, my God. <laughs> roll 1d6. So, yeah, so roll 1d6. All right, I got a whopping one. <laughs> you got a whopping one. So you have one hit point to go. Yep. At this point, I'm dipping. <laughs> You're just going to try to run out of here? I have a question now. Oh, sorry okay. to interrupt. So Hard technically... Work, so technically with burning bridges, he, he burns one of his bonds, right? Uh-huh. But he resurrects, right? So the god of death just technically acts for, what, a soul? So when, when Slim died, his soul went there, and then it came back. Does that clear Disco Tits and Slim? Yeah, I was hoping for that. <laughs> so, uh, so Joey, what this would mean is you have, to, you have to ditch one of your bonds. Yeah, I only have one. It would have been... So you have to you bail on. So you erase oh, that. Uh, yeah. So you have no relations with anybody in the world left, which no. is a, it, which is a, home with me still, correct? Right. But your your relations to them him are gone, which is a kind right. of death of in itself, a social death to a certain degree. For but sure. The, um, At least he's still attached to me. Still that but so you've got one hit point, and you're going to try to just get the hell out of here. Correct. Okay. But so, the question is, does this resolve? the death thing that that no because technically you're still alive although i i will say this it didn't need to be resolved right immediately as soon as jake saw you but he decided that was the way he wanted to go so that's the way we kind of went with it i will say since you've got one hit point and you can try to run away the best thing to probably do would be to have slim try to do a defy Try to do a defy danger roll to get away from Dr. Pilkus Goldstein. Because all he needs to do is one hit point of damage. So that's a 2d6, right? So it's, it would be 2d6 plus something, depending on how you're trying to get away. All right. How could I use a plus wisdom or constitution? <laughs> well, the plus constitution would just be enduring it, just trying to tough it out. And running, running, running away doesn't sound like you're toughing it out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like ignore the shit that. I'm plus it sounds, like it sounds like you're trying to get out of the way or act I'm fast, which would be dexterity. I said. Say again. Forget what I said. I'm enduring it. I, I, what I'm telling you is that doesn't work with running away. That doesn't make I sense. I, I'd rather endure it because my dexterity is nothing. Right, but narratively, it'd be like, are you gonna endure the heat? And you're like, yes, I'm gonna endure the heat. How? By getting out of the heat and going into the air conditioning. Like, oh, that's not enduring it. It's that kind of thing. All right, and then wisdom is outsmarting him, correct? 
it's it yeah it's like quick thinking in some kind of way is there so there's a way is there a way that you're trying to like get him out of the way hence quick thinking of how his typical reaction of hitting me in the balls is really good for every attack i i figure this and and jump out of the way knowing his character so well (gasps) i got an 11. got an 11. all right so we got an 11. oh (laughs) so oh but actually when you interfere you can knock him down by two I know. That's that's one of the things in this game that's like... It's a little bit different than some of the other ones. But yeah, so, Jake, if you... Well, a 10+, plus, they take plus one or minus two to their roll. So you'll roll your bond with him, which I know you don't have a bond, so you just roll literally 2d6. You if you want it. Do you get yeah. a modifier, though? Yeah. If I don't get... interfere, he lives? If you don't interfere, he literally just runs off. Then you'll have to you'll have to wait till later, which again might be very soon. What if I let him live at this point? I mean that that works because again, there's he's gonna uh, try and attack me well, later. Also, I'm running towards Matt and Barbard and they Mark. left you. They ain't helping. No, I'm you. running. Your ass. That's that's my end goal. I didn't roll it. I didn't get him. I rolled a five. All right, so you're like, get back here, you little, and he goes, woo, 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 and he gets out of here. At the moment, we've got Herzl Quarterling. He's leapt over these gnomes. He's running towards, but realizes he sees up ahead of him um, two of these dinosaurs that he may well have to uh, fight, uh, or at least he'll have to engage with. I think that's something that's going to be tough. Brandon and Frederico are like gullivered down by Lilliputian gnomes. Bard Bard, I think, is the next person who is going to kind of like arrive on this scene and he's going to encounter Brandon and Frederico. And there is a swarm of these gnomes. Oh, these little fucks. Yeah, so there's like 50 or 60 of these these little guys. And they're like, Jeez. you there, stop, stop there, you. Damn it, I was going to help. But there's a lot. <laughs> Think of them. Rule them over with your voice. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> um I'm gonna try to yeah, I'm gonna try to befriend them by singing to them. Is that a, is that an option? They don't know me. They they know her. She fucked up. Not me. <laughs> I mean I think they know they know of you guys. I'm naked, so, you know. <laughs> that's true, you are nude. But where you're wearing a jaunty hat, I think you said. I do. I have a, it's a fancy hat. Stylish cap is actually the phrasing. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Um. So uh, if I can't sing to them, I have another plan. All right. So, well, what's what's your goal here? Is your goal to help Brandon? Uh, get get them out of the the Gulliver esque ties. Is the goal to just get over these things and get the hell out of here? Is it to defeat all these little gnomes? No, I don't want to defeat them, you know? I'm a lover, not a fighter. Um, If I can, you know, somehow not get captured and save Brandon and Frederico, that would be ideal. But if that's not possible, you know, it's just, you know, for me not to get tied up. I'm a hefty dude. You know, you can see my picture. Yeah. You can see a lot of rope. (laughs) Okay. All right. So I think you're trying to get... Brandon, out of this situation. Yeah. So, could you... That's that's where I'm at. You could either <laughs> defy the danger, you could act... Yeah, so, yeah, you're trying to undo the ties that Brandon yeah. and Rico are under without well, being attacked by these gnomes, so... Yeah. What if I, um, what if I uh, untie them and sing charm at the same time? You know? Um, <laughs> defy danger with charisma. That's what I like to say. You know what? If you're trying to talk your way out of like and just stall them and give yourself enough time to untie this shit, I can yeah. buy that. That's where I'm going with it, man. All right, go for it. That's uh, two d sixes. Let me uh... two d six plus your charisma bonus. All right, I got you right now. So that's a um, I got an eleven. Eleven's pretty damn good. All right, so you're able to what What do you tell these gnomes that kind of keeps them at bay? They're still not your buddies, but they're not like immediately leaping on you or throwing other nets or grappling hooks on you as you're doing this stuff. Um, I'm gonna uh, tell them the story of Slim. I've been writing that, you know, the story of Slim okay. kind of distracts them. 
Oh yeah, so he is he is the one that uh that scared them initially. So yeah. maybe your story um kind of like makes them confused about Slim where they're like this is a different story than we when than we had thought was going on or maybe yep. it terrifies them where they're like my god, it is scarier than we thought. No, we're gonna go the heroic route. I'm okay, try they're to... like they're like this isn't what we heard before, and a, a yeah. couple other folks are like 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 this could be nonsense. I don't know, and they're it slows them down enough where you're like let's get out of here, and That's you're big. able to yank all these various things up, and Brandon and Frederico are able to kind of like hustle out of here with you. Nice. Success. And then I stab all of them with my spear. All right, I wasn't <laughs> there for that. I'm not do there you, for that. I'm gone. <laughs> do you do you attack these gnomes after you get up? I drag these gnomes and let my owl eat them. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so... Um, whew, yeah, so I guess this would be a hack and slash, because this isn't like an overwhelming number of them. It's just a ton of them. But they're four inches tall. So uh, go ahead and attack this horde of gnomes. With my strength? Yep. So 2d6 plus strength. I got 10. All right. 10's pretty good. So on a 10 plus, you can do two things. You can just deal your regular damage or you can deal, deal your regular damage plus 1d6, but open yourself up to their attack. Meaning that you'll also take damage. So you can just do damage to them and not take any damage yourself, or you can do damage to them, a ton of damage to them, but take some damage yourself. Oh, okay, I guess. I haven't been hit yet. Like, I haven't taken any hit points. Sure, so you want to just really wade into these bastards? Nah, let's just do the regular damage. Fuck okay, it. So go ahead and roll your regular damage, which I think is... It says D8, but I don't have a D8. I have only D- two D6s. Um, could... Do you have a D12? No. I don't have anything but the regular dice. <laughs> that's that's true. Um, <laughs> could somebody roll for Jess a D8? I rolled an 8 for you. I'll take that. All right. So you get <laughs> so an 8. So if there's like 40 to 50 of these gnomes... Um... Eight. It like knocks out like like a like a half of them. Where you're like, get out of here! And you're kind of whacking at them. Frederico grabs one, and munches on him. It's like, oh god, my Wait. children! Who who hurt my children? Um, and then you like kind of swat these things with your. At first, you start swatting them with your spear. And um, then quickly enough, you realize, like, wait a minute, and just start kicking a bunch of them. And they're like, God, oh, gee, oh. And, um, yeah, so you've kind of, like, are able to, to do that. And uh, who comes upon the scene next but Slim? Slim, you arrive at a, uh, a situation in which Brandon is uh, kicking a whole bunch of four-inch little David the Gnome-esque creatures that had uh, rakes and a few of them little, like, chopstick or pencil-sized spears. And Brandon's just absolutely destroyed, like, 15 to 20 of these things. A lot of them are running around like, Whoa! Muppet, Muppet arm style. Honestly, at this point, I'm going to keep going. Okay. Awesome. So you just keep going. All right. Um, Dr. Pocus, are you following close behind Slim or no? You keeping back a bit? Nah, I don't know. I'm just going, man, wherever life takes me. Can I start running? Because these things aren't going to catch me. They're small. All right. Yeah. So you can. So Brandon starts (laughs) running. Um, Slim has also run, run so uh, Brandon and Slim are kind of like running with one another. Dr. Pocus Goldstein, you're kind of looking at uh, I have a question. Go for it. Uh, can I get the God of Death back or what? You could maybe try to like look around at your environment and see what might make sense. 
you can maybe try to discern realities to figure that out. Okay, I do that. Awesome. Go ahead and roll 2d6 plus wisdom. 2d6? Mm-hmm. I got a 9 plus wisdom. Uh, just a 9. Okay, a 9. All right, so you get to ask one of those discern reality questions. What happened here recently? What is about to happen? What should I be on the lookout for? What here is useful or valuable to me? Who's really in control here? What here is not what it appears to be? What here is not what it appears to be? All right, so you already know that this is a cannon. Um, because Brandon yelled that uh, when they were trying to warn you about what was going on. Um, so you heard that, you just ignored it. I, I won't say like, oh, you didn't hear it. You heard it. But now that you realize that this is a cannon, you're thinking back to those crystals and how those crystals were like in those chambers with those skeletons with the moth wings. You realize that this is powered by, this cannon is probably powered by something connected to the god of death. So, um... If you could activate this cannon, uh, you'd certainly be in contact with the God of Death. So that's one one thing that would be uh, unseen is that like, oh, this is operated by it. And you know that the big thing that moves the God of Death, of course, is death. Um, okay. So... Um, yeah. That so is, he is the one operating the cannon, or what? Uh, the God of Death's power is what powers this cannon. Okay. Can... How would I get him to come take my soul? Hmm. Or fire the cannon and kill everyone in it? Well, one of the good things that you know... This goes into a dark place, but you certainly know a quick way to get uh, to get the attention of the God of Death. Blow into his tubes, right? Well, I mean, aside from blowing into his tubes, but from this side of the spheroid, you don't have any tubes to blow into. Okay. Uh, I bash my own nuts with my hammer, attempting to kill myself in sacrifice to the God of Death. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We see Dr. Pilkus Goldstein wind up and he's like, hi there. And then, and then the camera just zooms towards his own crotch. All right, we'll come back to that. All right. Herzl, you are running. You're running as fast as your tiny legs can carry you. Your legs being only like maybe like a foot long at the most. <laughs> They're very small legs and you're running and running and running. And like I said, you see two um, dino creatures, two of the dino legions. You see kind of like a big beefy one with like weird neck flaps um, carrying like a hammer. And... Can I, uh use my flexible morals and s convince them by saying I'm on your side. I'm on your side. I'm just a really tall version of, you know, that little village. I'm one of them. Let me pass. These people are savages because yeah. I could, you know what? That could maybe work. You also see a, um, like a Raptor in a, uh, like a bunch of robes who that has a long beard. Uh, and oh, it has like a pointy hat. And it's like, nah. <laughs> so you uh, you see these two dinosaurs, and um, yeah, these things are definitely as you're running running this way. These things, two things, are definitely going to attack you in some uh, if you don't do something about it. They don't believe in my uh, flexible morals, and well, what what are your I'm a midget? Ver I'm a tall version of the tiny city people. What does the flexible morals move do exactly? Uh, when someone tries to detect your alignment, you can tell them any alignment you would like. I don't think anybody... Yeah. I, think, I think that's more of a move for... Is that a move that you chose? It's a move that comes with the character. Okay, good. 
Yeah, that's more for if people are trying to tell if you're good, if you're evil, what your deal is. Um, Can that be this? I'm sprinting up to these people. I'm yelling. I'm just the tallest guy in Midgetville. Help me. <laughs> uh, let's say you're defying danger with charisma, and you can get a plus one because of that move. All right, let's go. 2d6. 2d6 plus charisma plus one. I got an eight. All right, you got an eight. So on a, on a, on a seven to nine, you stumble, hesitate, or flinch. The one in the in the with the pointy hat and the beard says, "Like, oh yes, oh you are a very tall one of these gnomes, yes, but here go this way, you there, gnome militia." And like a group of another forty of those gnomes, and he's like, "Go, go with them." And they're like, "I've never seen this guy before. I don't know." And he's like, "Yes, yes, yes. Go, go, go." So he's down for you to go, but now you're like being held by this gnomish militia. And it's another, it's another like thirty or forty of these peasant gnomes with rakes and uh, shovels and a few officers who have spears, which again are basically just pencils. I have a plan for this. I blend in. All right. So you're like, all right, guys, I'm one of you. <laughs> I start giving out fist bumps and stuff. I'm like, what's up, fellas? Here we go. Yeah. So you're basically like, like a giant NBA player at like a uh, <laughs> hanging out at like a kid's birthday party. <laughs> like, man, you're uh, enormous. <laughs> Whereas everyone else is literally like, oh, Godzilla's in the city. <laughs> oh amazing all right uh next up uh, next is bard 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 you're running this way right yeah you're trying to get the fuck out of there it's usually my plan i'm okay. also running the same way as bard bard if i may add me too no. i'm just slightly behind is okay. she up to kill things it's a long awesome. story so let's have let's have all three of you do this all of you are kind of running along when this like when each of you is like sees in a split second, like maybe you even hear it for a second first. Um, these handfuls of uh, like shuriken, like ninja stars, like thrown at you, and um, you're gonna have to defy this danger of um, this shuriken going your way. I use substitution dunchu. <laughs> Substitution Zoot Suit? Zoot Suit. It's from Naruto. Okay. <laughs> I, substitution Zoot Suit. <laughs> you go, you, you flash all the uh, sign language slash gang signs at it, and it turns into, like, butterflies? No, I turn into a log, and I'm somewhere else. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do you guys think? What, what would be the... Do you think you're getting out of the way by just, uh, you're like, I don't care if they hit me. I'll just, uh, fuck it. Just keep going. Or are you like, I'm going to duck and weave. I'm going to roll out of the way. Are you like, oh, I heard it uh, beforehand and I made sure not to be where I was. Tuck and roll. All right, Brandon, go ahead and roll plus dexterity. So you're rolling a defy danger, 2d6 plus dexterity. I got five. You got a five. That's not good. Um, does anybody want to help Brandon? I could try. Thanks. I leveled up now, so now I'm four. Well, if he helps you, you'll it pushes your. Oh no, because it's five. It would only go to six. Never mind. You can't help. You can't help him. So you're right. You do. You do. You do get another thing, and you do level up. Okay. So Slim and Bard Bard, you have to also make a similar. Uh, move, but you don't necessarily need to use dexterity. A 2d6? I'm, I'm gonna try just some dirt. You're just gonna be okay. So you're just gonna be like, I'm just gonna power through, baby. Or my constitution. So as a heads up, enduring it is the thing that's most likely to guarantee that you suffer some damage. Alright, I take it back. 
Okay. Just as a heads up, because yeah, it's like, like damage. I can handle all this damage. You have one hit point, man. You okay. can't handle any damage. I take it back. I'm gonna try and use my general knowledge of surviving as a salamander my whole life and the hardships that in that in, in entails and all the hardships that I've had growing up as a moist amphibious creature living and growing up in this hard world surrounded by humans with no other salamanders to accommodate myself with I'm going to use all of that like I use the moisture the movement you know I'm never going to let yeah all that all that wisdom that I've gathered in my life you know not intelligence wisdom it's that wisdom that I've grown I want to use that to maybe avoid this attack at all. Sure. Go for it. All right. <laughs> You're like, I hear this noise. I've heard this kind of noise so many times before. I got a 13. 13's pretty good. All right. So you hear this stuff and you see, you hear like, and like all these like um, shuriken, these ninja stars like kind of fly next to you and cut down. Um, uh, there's small creatures that the gnomes are raising as livestock. What would be a, uh, what would be the equivalent of like a tiny sheep? I don't know, a cat, a snail, a lamb. Snail. True enough, a lamb. What would be the t- equivalent of a tiny sheep for a creature that's four snail. inches tall? Uh, snails. Snails. Yeah, there's a bunch of oh, snails, and it just, and it just all these shurikens smash into these snails. Not the snails, dude. I wouldn't have picked them because they were gonna die. Yeah, we no, go we, appropriate, man. They got a mushroom farm. We go inside one of these uh, little like gnome huts. There's there's a uh, there's like a father gnome, and he sees the snails get killed, and he's like, dude, I I'm feel sorry. awful. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, there, Martha. It's gonna be a bad winter this year. And he just smokes his pipe a little while longer and stares off into the distance. All right, Bard Bard, looks like you're also making the, this uh, kind of roll. Dexterity, right? That one? I'm gonna go for that. I'm just gonna d- dodge. Sounds good. Sounds, sounds good. Sounds great to me. All right, that's two D6s, right? I'm pretty certain. Mm-hmm. All right, I got a seven. So on a seven. Okay. Yeah. So you're okay. in a. You know, not great. So you're in a slightly different situation. Okay. Well, so first thing first, Brandon, can you roll 2d6 for me? Yeah, I can, but I'm confused. Did I take a did I take damage? Yes, this I? is this is the damage right now. Oh, oh, I got 5 and 4, so 5. So 5. Okay, so unfortunately you're you're going to take 5 damage. If you've got any armor that blocks some of it. I have one armor. <laughs> okay, so you're going to take 4 damage as one of these shuriken like whips into your uh Forrest Gump style whips into your butt and you're like, it got right. me in the buttocks. <laughs> you're like, ah! Meanwhile, Bard Bard, you're seeing all these like shuriken and you're like like kind of running in one way and you're running another way. You're trying to like avoid all this stuff and there's a bunch of these things that are kind of flying right next to you and you're uh, very, uh, you're, you're serpentine running, trying to get away but the big thing is you keep changing direction and changing direction and changing direction. And that's when you run smack into this big, beefy dinosaur person oh, with like fr- with frills at its neck, and it looks down and just goes, Aah! and its neck fl- flies, does that thing that it flies out, and it has this big hammer. And um, so you're in a situation where like, yeah, you got away from the shuriken, but this isn't shuriken. good. So we've got Herzl with that gnomish militia. We've got um, Brandon just got hit in the butt with a ninja star. We've got Bard Bard in front of this uh, Dilophosaurus person with a giant hammer. Dilophosaurus is like the kind of animal that spit poison in Dennis Nedry's face. We've got um, uh, Slim was able to jump and kind of leap out of the way. So he's okay and is maybe seeing all of this stuff. Meanwhile... Dr. Pilkus Goldstein. He was just going to town on his own chicken nuggets. Got it, dude. <laughs> All right. So, have I, uh, have I trolled the game enough? All right. So, 
we're going to arrive at this point, and it's going to be real tough because you actually already had this in a way. But you, you, you basically give up on doing this thing. And you arrive at a gl- when you, you catch a glimpse of what lies beyond the black gates of death's kingdom. So you're dying. What does that look like to Dr. Pilkus Goldstein? So if we're entering Dr. If we're entering Dr. Pilkus's possibly near death experience or straight up like Dr. Pilkus is dying, what do we see from his perspective? I think it's just a room full of all of the smashed nuts that I've smashed <laughs> on my journey of nut smashing. Yeah. <laughs> the room it's, is full oh, of it's it's a it's a it's a waiting room. It's his doctor's yeah. waiting room. No, no, it's like a trophy room, and they're oh, all just okay. hanging from the ceiling on fishing wire, smashed fishing like uh, wire. <laughs> like like uh, Christmas ornaments. It, yeah, so you see that, and each one has a. Um, there's a button that you can press on the wall, and when you press it, it, it describes. Oh, it tells you the story of like who this person was and how you smashed their nuts. <laughs> so what's the, what's the funniest one that we encounter when you walk through this and you press one of the buttons? My own. Yeah. It was like, it's like, it's me, Dr. Pilkus Goldstein. I bashed my own nuts. <laughs> These are my nuts. <laughs> you see Jorge, Jorge, the God of death um, is there, but he, um, it says he's dressed as a docent from the Nut Museum. And so he's dressed as a docent, like who like guides people around. He's a, a tour guide. And you see a bunch of tourists coming through, and he's like, And these and were the these nuts were the that the he nuts smashed, on, smashed his on his 10th birthday. birthday. And he says, Oh, oh look, who's, look here. who's here. It's Dr. It's Dr. Pilkus, Pilkus himself. himself. And like all the tourists are taking photos of you. And he says, oh, oh wonderful. wonderful. You've, you've, arrived. you've arrived. It's so good it's so to good see to you see here you at your here museum of your, museum your own, own accomplishments. accomplishments. And there's also Joey's first dead body there. There's an, empty, there's an empty area that says, I am. I've resurrected. It's not I've required a new body. I've, I've resurrected. You didn't resurrect. It's you had it in. <laughs> Based on the way that stuff is written, it's not that you resurrected, it's that you didn't die. <laughs> it's that you avoid dying by bailing on your bonds. And so you're basically like, I don't care what even Bard Bard thinks of me. I'm, I'm going to keep going. All right, so I've definitely avoided death, resurrected. <laughs> Again, not, not the same thing unless, uh, yeah, not the same thing. That'd be like, oh, I almost fell down. You know, I was resurrected. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that car almost hit you. Oh, thank God. We're born again. We're different people. We have new souls now. We survive every day, bro. Each day is a new resurrection. You know? That's true. Wake day, up, we just resurrect. Each time. day is a new resurrection. True enough. Sleep is just death. Am I right? True enough. Sleep is death. Um, in French, <laughs> orgasm means death. little death. So every time. Yeah, yeah, I got you. All right, so uh, so Dr. Pilkus is there, and he sees an area that is like a blank area, and it says Slim's Nuts. Poor oh, hey, hey. Says to you, like, it seems it like there's a, like a missing link, link in your collection, in your collection of, sweet of sweet smashed, smashed balls. balls. I call him a bitch. Oh, oh no. no. You, I'll you, take you in the nuts, bitch. Oh, oh. My nuts My are the nuts, nuts of nuts. death. death. And he says, "Do you wish? Do you wish, do you wish to, to go wish back to go and back collect and more of your? Oh, your collect all my friends' nuts. <laughs> yeah, more of your more hostile huevos. Yep. Yes. yes well. well. All right. Well. So, or so. Go ahead and make a roll. Literally, just two d six. Just a flat roll. Okay. I rolled it. What did you get? A nine. A nine. On a seven to nine, death will offer you a bargain. So you'd already been offered a bargain of to live. You have to give um, Slim's soul over to Jorge, the god of death. On a... um, In this situation, 
he's going to want something even more or death is going to want something even more. So I'll give him slim and I'll give him Herzl. Is Herzl like an actual friend of yours? He's the only person I have a bond to. Hmm. And he says like, Ooh, yeah. So, oh, but so truthfully though, is Herzl a friend of Dr. Goldstein's? I believe so. I think it is. Hold on. I'll give him, I'll give him Slim, Herzl, and I'll sever my own nuts and give him those. So, to him, dude. <laughs> yeah, to, to death, the big deal here is uh, like you doing this is the bigger thing because, from death's perspective, he'll get all these things eventually. Yeah, I, my, my bond with Matt is that he owes me his life, whether he admits it or not. So, he owes me this, in my opinion, he owes me his life, dude. Gotta kill him. Ooh. So, yeah, so I think he'll say, like, uh, I think uh, Tim Curry, Jorge, the god of death, turns to you and says, like, if you're if willing, you're willing. Yeah. and so, and so desire, desire, so desiring so desire of your life back, your life if you're back. willing, if you're willing, willing to, to not only, not only mm, mm, bring me bring your friend me Herzl, Herzl, whose life whose is, already, is yours, already yours, as you, as say. you say, yeah. <laughs> But also, but also if, if you get you your get hands, your on, hands this, on this, my delectable, my delectable device. device. And he points to like a model of how this works. And you on see the that there's, like, yeah, there's a, in, on the top of the mountain, there is essentially like this enormous, the top of the mountain can rotate like a turret, essentially. And this tube is a cannon, this enormous cannon that's powered by the God of Death. And it could basically be used to destroy the uh, the dinosaur legion that's attacking the city of King K. Casserole. And he basically says, like, what he wants you to do is he's like, oh, that dinosaur army, it's just going to, uh, it's going to conquer, it's going it's to going conquer, to that, conquer city. that city. Conquering, Conquering is not nearly, is not nearly enough. enough. I want, I you, want to you to destroy it. destroy it. So he basically says, like, oh, totally destroy the city of the people that hired you to do this. And uh, do that and kill Herzl, and yeah, you'll you'll be able to live again. How would I destroy the city? And he he's telling you with this cannon, basically. Oh, like this All weapon right. could this weapon could just destroy the city that the dinosaurs are attacking right now. And how do I make it fire? And he'll and he'll say like. It, it, fuck it. He'll just tell you, like, from the gunnery nest, nest on the top, top dear. dear. And he'll All point right. to a thing on the top, like, at the, basically at the peak of the mountain, like, oh, that's where there's, like, a, like, a nest of where there's controls and shit. All right, so I ask him to spawn me up there, to bring me back over there so I can fire this thing and kill everyone at the same time. And he'll say, like, oh, oh it'll be so it'll much be so more much fun, more though, fun to watch you arrive on your own. own. Ta -ta. And um, we see you, and you're like, my nuts, time to destroy them. And you swing your hammer down, but you just clip the tip of your wang. And you're like, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Thank you again for listening to This American Dice Presents Dungeon World, Cousins Edition. Aside from learning that Dungeon World does not handle uh, player versus player combat that well, this penultimate episode also included the talented voice acting of Matthew as Herzl Quarterling, Jake as Dr. Pilkis Goldstein, Jess as Brandon the Ranger and Frederico the Owl, Joey as Slim the Salamander Immolator, Again, a salamander who is an immolator, not a person who immolates salamanders. And Vinny as Bard Bard the Bard. Austin was your dungeon master. This episode also had a hell of a lot of music in it, including, in order of appearance, or whatever you call the audio version of that, Q5 Dark Somber Sad Spooky Ambient, Even in My Dreams by Solar Flare, Land of a Folk Divided by Midair Machine, Trenches by Cowpay, 
Churchy by Coven, Petrichor by Midair Machine, Tend to It by Osiris Saline, and Evening Fly of the Brants by Lobo Loco. Please like and subscribe or rate the show if you have something positive to say. That'd be great. And be sure to tell a friend. Join us next week for another exciting episode of This American Dice. Yeah, and, and, and Vinny's toenails need clipping. I do, I do, I do agree that like if I did learn that about our world currently, it would be very drastic. That's literally the worst answer I've ever heard. Also, Q3 Dark Heavy Anger Fear Metal Church of the Self by Solar Flare. Can't forget about that one. I do, I do, I do agree that like if I did learn that about our world currently, it would be very drastic. <laughs>